All right. Welcome, folks, to the next episode of the Book Club. Book Club is just a hangout session for folks to come and share their interests and things that they've learned in the past week or since their last Book Club session. It's a great way for people to, um, you know, share what they're learning and, you know, help others kind of just learn about exciting things that uh, other DAO members are a part of. So we're just going to jump right in and get started. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy. Yeah, so um, we read in um, this book, um, When Money Dies, um, a very interesting book. Uh, but I think what I would like to discuss is um, a very interesting Twitter thread by um, Punk6529 about NFTs. And it gives a very, very um, futuristic look at, look, um, look at how you know, NF NFTs uh, might evolve and some really, really um, revolutionary um, potential use cases of NFTs. So I posted the thread in the 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 book club channel <laughs> and people are actually offering <laughs> to pay people to read the thread and i i actually understand after you know going over the the thread myself like it, it's very very insightful right so he built a point from currently where we are with nfts using them as you know pfps and then he he tries to list some problems that we have as uh, humans now and then he links them to nfts and how they can potentially solve um those problems right so he start off with um bitcoin solving the byzantine generous problem and allowing for decentralized consensus right so then he continues by you know acknowledging that and then praising the people who you know the bitcoin maximalist and then he goes on to say that our current world is basically or the technological world is basically run by people who own databases right so he 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 basically says that modern society is run on databases and these databases are owned by what he he refers to as ttps which is trust trusted third parties and so an example might include like amazon google facebook uber you know all these people who owns these huge databases and so because they own the the database is that basically runs the world, the world infrastructure and some of the crucial systems like the financial you know, systems. It it basically means that you know they basically run the world, right? <clears throat> and so, I mean, how does NFT comes in? So he goes on to you know, for modern society to function at current scale, you know, for you to travel, for you to earn money, for you to vote, for you to like get a taxi or everything these um these uh trusted third parties that run these databases can make it basically impossible if they want to for you right so for me like the what i picked from all that is basically we have government all right but the key people who actually run the order the people who own the databases you know and everything right now is data so how does nft comes in so there's a point that he makes where he he states that imagine like um taxis right like 10 years ago and they were operating normal and the uber comes in and then disrupts the taxi industry 
but Uber has data like everything about you, where you pick the car, who you interacted with, everything. So if Uber wants to go like evil, or if if an if an evil dictator decides to take over Uber or influence Uber, it has the potential to like cause a lot of harm, right? So he picks it from there. Oh, all right. So there is a um, this the twenty third thread, right? So he pauses and um goes back to recap whatever he has said. Then he clearly lists that so BTC solved decentralized consensus, but there's centralized consensus everywhere. And you know, there are trusted third parties which who cause a lot of you know micro problems. You know, you look at the Facebook, you look at the Googles and everything, they cause a lot of problems like anti-competitive. They don't they don't want people to compete with them and all that they manipulate their system. So here is where he, he links the whole thing to JPEGs, right? Like nfts <laughs> so he asked the question though so how does this all connect to jpegs meaning like nfts right so um i'm going to read some of his points just to you know really um flesh out the points that he, he tries to make so he said that starting in 2013 he was basically you know talking about um, how decentralized social networks, you know, could be built using um, NFTs, like some things like NFTs. But if you look at our, our system right now, or if you look at where crypto, the whole crypto universe is right now, we haven't really achieved that. And for now, it, when you analyze the, the crypto um, ecosystem in a whole, there's there are certain reasons why you know we haven't really been able to build decentralized social systems and this is because basically crypto has been you know highly financialized everything has been about finance 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 and that has made the infrastructures that is being built around this financial stuff very very centralized right so if, if you look at the crypto right now, centralized exchanges play like major roles in the ecosystem that if most of them go offline right now we can have serious you know problems he also lists that tons of goods and ideas right now in the in the crypto space is in violation with u.s security laws right so you, you can give example even the bank token for instance today on the core the the we had the the legal guild doing a lot of research on on you know how bank and how bank and the law you know interact in various jurisdictions and so according to him you know currently you know that's a problem that we are facing so he goes on to say so then how does you know nfts solve um these uh, you know these problems and what what gives nfts the special traits um or characteristics to solve you know these these problems and enable them to build like decentralized social systems and he goes on to mention some of them and states that you know they are constitutionally you know protected free speech um they can represent their norms of the world which is non-fungible that they can be used to build decentralized social organizations so he gives this um trajectory where he lists you know where we are using crypto as collectibles and arts and he basically projects into the future to 2030 where he he states you know we will move from collectibles and arts to gaming and we are seeing that coming in and he connected that very soon we will see nfts in brands right so you have um brands such as um adidas nike supreme they will be connecting to nfts he links them to culture the metaverse off-chain assets and then he finally links them to what off-chain governance so and he lists that nfts will be will be the financialization transport layer 
for intangibles first, then off-chain assets second. Yeah, so he 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 makes this map that that's like very very amazing and his ability to project the whole thing into the future. I mean, I haven't come across any NFT article or research document that has really captured the potential use case of you know NFTs in this way, like before, since you know all this NFT craze and all that. So for me, it, it it's it's very very encapsulating, and I've shared it in the in the the book club channel for people who are interested to you know to to go through. And another thing he also states is the fact that NFTs can be used to you know represent so many intangible aspects of life that we we live every day that is you know that that has been like impossible to represent and maybe quantify up till now right so culture is one of the, the important things you know he talks about the ability to represent culture and monetize that like will play a very major role in the future that we are going using you know nfts so I, I this this article is i mean i saw it like 30 minutes ago before the session and i just decided to drop the <laughs> the book that i'm reading and just go through this um thread and and it's, it's very very amazing so that's what i've got to share and i've shared it for people who want to like take their time and then go through it i think it's it's very very important yeah thank you that's what i have for this week that's great. Thanks a lot for sharing that and for breaking it down. I, I pulled up the thread. Um, I'm going to take a look at that after the call. Um, he, he opens with, however bullish you are on NFTs, you are wrong. You are insufficiently bullish. So yeah. <laughs> he, he starts it off uh, like he's trying to agitate everyone. I kind of like that. Um, so that that's a good one. Um, I'll definitely be reading that. And I I hope you uh, come back next week with How Money Dies because I pulled that up. And that looks interesting uh, about the Weimar Republic. That's That's got to be a good one. Yep, yep, yep. All right. Um, Merkel, you're not muted. Do you want to jump in here? Yeah, no, I I thought that was like a a really interesting take, um, kind of in terms of like how I don't know because I'm also very very bullish on like the NFT space, um, and I think like the perspective I have on it is like you, it, it's all about like being culturally relevant, and there's more and more information coming out every day, so like you see a lot of people trying to find what's going to be culturally relevant because I think like your online identity is like going to be more important as we continue down this path. So I, I, I do think like, I like that, um, the thing that think decade was sharing, uh, where, how far back is that in the book club? Uh, like the link. Yeah. I guess like things I've been looking at this week or from last week, were also kind of focused on NFTs. Um, I'm like, I'm starting kind of like a newsletter about crypto. So like I was kind of focusing on like the NFT theme as well from the last week. So um, I don't know if I've, I, I did read a couple things. I think there's a really good newsletter that um, I would definitely subscribe to. I'm going to actually put this in. His name's uh, Rex Woodbury. Um, and he is a very, very... Uh, uh, insightful uh, person uh, when it comes to like just the crypto space so I like to follow um, him as well should I put this in like the just the general yeah I think that's, yeah. yeah that's, okay it's Substack. yeah cool yeah so he has like a lot of great things to read about so I think I read the social tokens and creator centric economy one um, but I think I like his take on kind of the he was kind of like analyzing the psychology of collectors and um I think that's also just an aspect that we tend to forget about a lot or not forget about but all like almost like overlook or take for granted to in a sense because it is kind of fascinating I think just like from like the psychological perspective how people are just can be just insanely like 
crazy, not crazy, but, you know, um, passionate about certain projects or collectibles. So, yeah, I think that that was an interesting read that I had this week. Um, cool. Very good. Um, I've gone ahead and added that to my ever growing collection of Substack subscriptions. And um, speaking of Substack subscriptions, Thank you for explaining optimistic roll up in one paragraph. <laughs> I I needed that. So that was cool. Thank you for the feedback too. I'm Jay, you have something? I see your mic is on. So do you have something you wanna talk about today? Thanks for sharing that stuff, uh Think Decade and Merkel. That was really interesting. Um Yeah, uh, I was actually wor- working on something a little less interesting. Um <laughs> a friend was pitching me this uh, one uh, this one crypto project, Alluvium. Uh, I don't know if you guys heard of it. It's, it's like a it's, it's a crypto video game, but it's a triple A title, so it's going to be like an sort of like an MMORPG in the same vein as like Pokemon Go or something. Not Pokemon Go, but like Poke the Pokemon universe and um, you know, in, in glorious crypto multiplayer. So. I he was really hyped about it, and I'm I'm a little less hyped on video games that haven't come out yet that are raising capital. I just I just <laughs> they don't have a great uh they don't have a great track record. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, um no, but I I was just you know doing my due diligence. Um, it has some really cool concepts, some really cool ideas. Um, the team seems solid, uh, but uh the the whole i believe the whole concept is you go to these different areas um they have like all these different mechanics for um you know capturing creatures and going to these different and the whole idea is to make it you know uh play to earn instead of uh, pay to play uh which you know assuming they can stick to that model i'm, I'm always for um of course everything's on the blockchain it's all nfts i think it's i don't know what it's either i think it might be based on like uh ethereum or something um so I mean, assuming they can pull it off, I think it could be massive, right? Like, I if if they could pull this off, this could be the thing that gets gaming gamers into crypto, because um, it's just it it's really incredible what they're building. That but the the big if there, right, is if they can pull it off, right? Um, I did uh, have participated in a couple game jams, and I know like there's so many things that can go wrong. Um, and because there's so many moving parts when you develop a video game. And so I don't know I'm just, I'm just I'm I'm not sold quite yet. I mean I think assuming they can they can execute their vision, I think it's gonna be great. But the big F of course is if they can execute their vision. I mean l- look at Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. I mean I I was so hyped for that game. I mean I, I I was I was hooked on that hopium man. And then it came out and I mean Okay, I still have a couple hundred hours sunk in that thing, but it's nothing compared to what we were promised. So I guess I, I could just be cynical, having been burned by, by games so much. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's a cool project, and if you guys are interested, here, I'll, I'll drop you guys a link. Um, Luvium. Um, but, yeah, no, it's... it, it they, I, I want it to succeed, I just... I'm not gonna believe it till I see it. That's kind of kind of where I'm at. That's reasonable. Okay. So they got the beta. The beta's okay. open. Yeah, the beta yeah, is open. Oh, that, so I mean, the, okay. Yeah, the beta's open. It's testable. I haven't uh, had the time to go in it and test it. I've been super happy with Gods Unchained on Immutable X. And Gods Unchained. Yeah, Gods and Chains is really good, it's especially if you like more strategy-based card games that take a little bit longer. Um, no, I'm super huh. excited about Illuvium too, and yeah, I think like gaming gamers are are probably gonna be, you know they're all gonna be onboarded on the crypto oh, yeah. in five years no, th- every single the, one of them. the question i don't think is if there's going to be a successful game it's like okay what is, what's it going to be like what's going to be the big giant game that's going to pull everyone you know it's going to have everyone talk about not just us crypto nerds because you know i mean i i got involved a little bit into the crypto gaming sphere like a few months ago with like alien worlds and such and i was like yeah eh, they're not not really 
that great. But if they, if you can make a real game that's actually legitimately fun to play in that of itself, I think that that's a game changer right there. Pun intended. It's just a question of which one is it going to be. I'm waiting for Call of Duty NFTs <laughs> yeah. now. <laughs> Definitely a AAA game is probably going to get the most like onboarding. Um, yeah. See, I think I think it's going to be totally different. I think right now what we're seeing is that the blockchain. You have games based on decentralized technology, creating games that are still based on centralized power over concepts. And so I think the blockchain game that is going to emerge in a couple of years is going to be a game that teaches people how to self-organize. Hmm. And and it's going to be a gamification of like, you know, there might be comp, there might be a, you know a game, a Dow Dow Masters game where right. you know, yeah, your your goal isn't to try to create the largest Dow or the biggest Dow or the the most the Dow with the most guns, you know, what's the new metric that's gonna be what everybody wants to achieve or learn, and that that's what's going to emerge is it's going to yeah. be like yeah it's going to be like a sim city but with DAOs, huh you know and and solving <laughs> social issues like what think decade was referencing in, in that one article it's like when you start solving social issues with games mm -hmm. you're gonna have whole you know i think much more onboarding and yeah and use value i, I yeah. think i think i agree with Ernest as well. Like I think there's gonna there might be room for both, and I don't I I assume at least one so, someone here listened to the gaming uh, bankless podcast. Uh, but the the woman that they had on, when she said uh, that these game industry like companies are gonna start saying like not how do I drive revenue but how do I drive GDP? That was like one of the best ways I think you could. Yeah. Play. You're you're developing like literal nations with like Axie Infinity, right? Like these are like entire like populations of people. That are making an in-game economy so i think ernest is right that there might also be like like there's probably going to be like two types of games like there's going to be like the entertaining you know like fast-paced game but then there's going to be more of like the mmo type game right like where the, where we kind of make the rules inside the game yeah and I, I i i definitely am pretty excited for i mean that. i think block the like adding blockchain to to gaming is something that was like it's such a perfect match that I feel like, I mean, I mean, just look at the CSGO skins, right? Those were huge when CSGO was in its prime. And, and that was that wasn't even an NFT. That was just, you know, on Steam's platform. So imagine if you could take that. But, you know, I, I mean, like the, the, the possibilities, I mean, like imagine having an NFT of a game, even if the servers go down, but you still have that NFT. Like imagine the, the you could like that, that, that cross. I guess a cross-use value, or or like you could have um, a sequel to a game, but you keep all the 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 items from the first game that you collect. Like there's just there's so many um, incredible uses for it. Um, I mean, uh, there's already MMOs that have you know their own essentially their own in-game economy and everything, but this this is just it it, it increases that concept to a whole new level. And I think again, I, I think. There'll be pro in the in the future, just like how there are now more games that are, um, probably more games that are released by big companies that are online than single player. I think in the future there's going to be more games that like AAA titles are going to be released that are you know on the blockchain than not. I mean it's just it's such an obvious next iteration in the in the evolution of gaming, and I'm I'm really excited. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm 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 I'm. I'm really excited to see where this goes. Again, though, I am hesitant because building a game is an incredibly complex and difficult process, <laughs> and then you adding this extra layer of complexity and difficulty on top of that. I think I, I think it's just going to take some trial and error before we figure out how to properly and smoothly integrate those two features. Um, a question I have for everyone is like, because um, Ernest is talking about like you know we'll teach ourselves coordination. Do you guys ever see there's like a world where we end up settling like disputes just through games instead of in real life? Like if we have like 
all these all this economic value actually in the game, then the losses are pretty real. Hmm. Do you guys I think? That. Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting. That is a really interesting idea. Like I don't know how much like social like that, that would take such like a behavior change in like the entire world that I don't think it's gonna be in the next. I mean I don't know. I I got I guess like people say don't uh, underestimate like the exponential like function, but maybe not in the next ten years. Like it's got to be like a little bit farther down in my eyes. But um. Well, you know, we don't have to wait. Bro, come at me. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll sell this right now. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Uh, I can definitely imagine that. Uh, you know, just spending so much time reading science fiction, I've, I've long believed that eventually the, the military machinery will reach the point where it's too good to use. And uh, every, everyone who has them will just be in a permanent standoff simply because they have them. And yeah. any use of them means total destruction. So yeah. gaming would be a good way to settle it. Yeah. But I'm, just thinking, I'm just yeah. thinking, like, in the future, so kind of, like, pull on that thread. Um, but, like, what if, um, like, you, you have all these, like, you know, the, these different DAOs set up and you have these different, uh, like, maybe within games or maybe within communities or whatnot. Like, will there have to be a whole new legal code that is created to manage, you know, like, what happens if two DAOs have a direct conflict to each other? Like, how do they, they resolve that? You know, like, are, is there going to be whole systems in place to, because that, I, I can see, like, if DAOs go mainstream, which I, th I think they probably will, um, then there's going to be conflict. And so how are we going to resolve those conflict between DAOs? I think, like, there, and could gaming be a way to do that? I don't know. I think that's a really fascinating idea. There's so many, so much potential in this space. I love it. Yeah, I think <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a smart contract. Last smart week. Contract. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, when I was describing Lockbox Magazine's article last week, we briefly touched on this idea that one of the concerns that courts are already starting to raise is what what does it mean like uh, to say summon a smart contract to court? Can can they do that? Do they have that ability, and if so, what what does that really mean? Uh, it's a whole new world where there are things making decisions that can't be called into a courtroom to testify and defend themselves. Yeah. I mean, I'm no lawyer, but this seems like a really fascinating, like, new frontier of, you know, the, the legal code of, um, yeah. Uh, it's, it's cool stuff. Maybe, maybe, like, governance. Like, if anyone's interested in looking into that topic more, I feel like... I know, like, Vitalik wrote that article, like, beyond, like, token governance, and there definitely needs to be more infrastructure if, like, DAOs want to scale to the mainstream. And I think, like, maybe gaming might push that, like, push the envelope a little bit if we need to start settling things. Um, I don't know. All right. That is good stuff. Um... That's that's actually a good segue into my topic. For okay. hell yeah. <laughs> um, so I've uh, been working on um, a music NFT project with some artists, trying to get some uh, you know original audio files to put into an NFT, and the, and the discussion is for like a DJ you know who mixes music like how do they go about getting their their mixes into something that's not going to get them sued and um essentially they gave us links to the legal guild so then we went dropped our question into legal guild um and the legal guild recommends you know, one knowing like about creative common attributions. Um, and then if you're, um, you know, if you're a DJ mixing other people's stuff, it seems like the safest way to go about it is using, you know, stuff that's already 
licensed for Creative Commons use, right? And so, yeah, that's essentially, you know, the legal guild says like, P.S. Don't mix stuff which doesn't support the shared alike attribute. Um, and so, for you know, any artists out there, folks that know artists um, and wanting to get into NFTs, you know, you're gonna want to pay attention to finding, you know, other art to augment or mix or whatever that is already under a Creative Commons license. And yeah, so that's the real sh short summary of, of what, my topic. I really like the idea of using Creative Commons for something like that, as long as the the other parties who might want to use it can understand it. It can be a little technical and obscure, and maybe somebody can be really into music and really great at making music, but not necessarily understand that this Creative Commons things is out there or how it works. Uh, I have a little bit of experience there myself where I was part of a group of people that made a set of rules for running Brazilian Jiu Jitsu tournaments, and we made it Creative Commons and really encouraged other tournament circuits to just take our rules and run with them. And it was just too much for other grapplers to understand. Some would just take it entirely and copy the document and leave our name in it and publish it on their website, which was confusing to everyone. It was just, you know, like I said, too technical and obscure, but I hope it becomes more mainstream. Uh, well, I think it will. And I think it's a big tie in to the other discussions that we were having. And, you know, a lot of the, the discussions in the blockchain space is like, how, how do you then create, you know, public goods? You know, as, as soon as a DAO can maintain your roads easier, better and easier and more ecologically sustainable than your government <laughs> um, road company, then that DAO is good. That, that road company is going to go under. DAO is going to buy those physical assets. And then you got a community running their own, you know, roadway system for repairs. Like, that, <laughs> you know, that's kind of a basic thing. There's a lot of, a lot of interesting ideas for DAOs, right? A lot of like uh, great creativity, but, you know, humans create pathways okay. and we rely on our governments maintain and keep those pathways and you would think it would be an easy process in city government but even roads you know is is a huge process for humans to try to coordinate around you know given our current society sure i do have a thing this week i will try not to take too much time with yeah. um I did a white paper this week. I read a white paper and have some notes to share. And it's not anything new. A lot of you are probably familiar with it. Uh, it is the Meta Cartel Ventures white paper version 1.0. It was written in December of 2019. So it's not new. Um, so Meta Cartel's Ventures, uh, it's a venture DAO. It's a for-profit group that was created to invest in early stage dApps. Uh, originally, it was a community in 2018, not a venture DAO, just a community, a technical working group. And there were some pretty cool projects then uh, that, you know, I think we're all familiar with now, like Gnosis and ENS and Argent that came out of that. And after about a year, they decided to launch the DAP incubator and became the first fork of the Moloch DAO. So... Um, they, the the Meta Cartels Ventures is a for-profit investment DAO that's coupled with a legal a legal entity. They they call that their unique brew of crypto anarchy. I like that <clears throat> that phrase. Um, so it's a pairing of code and law, uh, which is to say, it's the combination of the Moloch smart contract standard and a Delaware. LLC. They looked at what was kind of on the landscape at the time, and they saw a lot of organizations forming, touting this principle of code is law, 
and they thought that was a little bit flawed and that it made more sense to combine the existing legal entities with software where the um the so they call it qualified code deference so it's not two separate things the the LLC and the um and the smart contract are kind of working together as as one thing um you can imagine the advantages are pretty much the standard things that we see from DAOs in general, um, diversified um, due diligence. They have a lot of different people with different experience in different topics. They can distribute their decision-making process and uh, improves their ability to discover projects, and it spreads out risk. But it is... Their setup is not perfect, and they recognized that from the start. Uh, two of the trade-offs they pointed out was that there's no lockup, as there is traditionally with venture capital. Anyone can leave with no notice immediately, just you're out. And anyone can be kicked by the by decision of the group. <clears throat> Get a little bit more into that in a minute. And... Um, Majority-based decision-making has its challenges where if something's controversial, it's difficult to pass. Uh, they do have a rather strange vocabulary if you're not already familiar with MetaCartel. Their operating agreement, they refer to it as a grimoire, like as in Book of Spells. So if you have a background in fantasy and RPGs, it's comfortable i guess uh but a little strange they uh they have three types of members mages goblins and summoners <laughs> for real <laughs> so <clears throat> the uh membership is permissioned and curated so if someone wants to join there's an application process and then a voting process by the existing members but exiting is completely permissionless. Um, all members of the DAO are managing members of the LLC, so they have to have an active, at least understanding, they have to remain informed on what the, uh, the DAO is engaged in. The three levels that I mentioned, the mages are the active participants who are doing research and finding opportunities, doing the due diligence and conducting the asset management. Um, any DAO member that is not an accredited investor has to be a mage. That's by SEC regulation. They have to be at that most active level. People who are accredited investors in the United States can choose to reduce their role. And at that point, they become a goblin. So they have the same stake. They're just a little less is expected of them on a day-to-day -day basis. And then they have the summoners, who are the operational delegates, who do things like legal services, financial services, accounting, coordination, that sort of thing. But they're not full members, and it doesn't matter if they're accredited or not. They have two different types of voting. They're ordinary voting and their extraordinary proposals. Those would be... Meta rules changes. Uh, meta rules changes require 69% of the vote, I believe, because memes. Uh, but ordinary votes uh, are all done on chain and it's majority rules. So that would. Oh, is somebody trying to say something? Oh, sorry. I thought I was muted. I'm just laughing so hard because I imagine like, oh. So how did you guys d decide on, um, you know, what, what qualifies as majority vote? <laughs> um, it's, it's, you'd have to check out this meme to understand. <laughs> well, we kept 120% of the vote, so we had to settle on 69%. <laughs> so the on-chain stuff, which is the majority of their voting... Um, that's for things like membership admission, membership expulsion, and whether or not they fund a project. Um, I mentioned before, 
anyone can leave at any time. They call that rage quitting. Uh, you can also use the rage quit functionality to just reduce your position without completely leaving. And when you rage quit, you receive rage tokens and rage claims. Rage claims are non-transferable smart contracts that settle settle you out. Um, the group uh, can decide to rage kick someone, and that has the same result. Uh, it's an on-chain vote, and then that person gets settled out by the contract, and they're no longer a member. The... Uh, the whole thing is an LLC, and it's taxed as a U.S. partnership, which means the LLC does not pay taxes. The members do. They have accountants that prepare Schedule K-1s for every member, and every new member has to submit a W-9 or a uh, comparable form. Their uh, asset management, as I mentioned, is primarily... Uh, on-chain done by the smart contract that's called Guild Bank, but they also have, the LLC has a bank account for things that they have to pay for off-chain. And then the uh, the document ends up uh, with some technical description of rage quit edge cases and how they're handled uh, if the rage quit, quit or rage kick process goes bad. There are some technical reasons why it might fail, and they have procedures in place to handle that. And they describe the the flow of assets on chain to their projects, and they have some charts that show how money moves <clears throat> from the DAO to a project that they're sponsoring and how they receive funds back. And then finally, it closes with like two pages of legal jibber jabber. But the only thing I didn't really cover is the the technical detail on the the rage quitting process, which is somewhat interesting. Yeah, but like you you have done a wonderful job with like the way you've explained it. I mean, I've heard I've heard a lot about Meta Cartel, but the way you've just uh, summarized and explained the whole thing, wow, <laughs> great job, Thank man! You. No, I appreciate wow. it. Yeah. This person called Joseph Pallant was interviewed. Um, the podcast is called A Redefined Life, and it was actually the podcast that kind of got me to brave enough to jump into a DAO and have a go. Um, but the episode is about um, Joseph Pallant putting the Paris Climate Agreement on Ethereum. And... Um, he's part of the Blockchain for Climate Foundation, which I assume is not a DAO, um, but they are working to be able to um, have a national accounting of emissions connected through a ledger recording international transfer of emissions reductions. Um, so having everybody kind of on the same ledger which then paves the way for proactive investment into climate projects technologies and policies so i thought that was interesting because kind of you know another effort in that sort of same space been talking about open access to research for so many years and covid has accelerated that in terms of finally people realizing the value of kind of sharing data and sharing their research findings um, around COVID and all of the open access advocates around the world are saying hey why don't we just you know take that learning and apply it to the other massive problems facing humanity <laughs> and all the giant publishers are like oh no hold on hold on Nelly <laughs> hold your horses we don't want to actually give away everything so open access has ground to a halt again because there's too much money tied up in keeping it a secret. Well, and the the i the IPCC and their you know network of friends they like suppress the research that's open openly available even mm. like they won't even acknowledge. You know, it's like 
They're like, if it hasn't been be- been researched for three years, we're just not going to include it. <laughs> you know, even though they have good research, so it's like, yeah, it's such a huge problem, and at every layer, you know, there's an opportunity for either more coordination or open access or decentralized storage or just being, being honest something. I just realized Sasha is gone, but um, they left a, an article about synthesized starch from CO2 um, in the channel, which I've put in the notes as well. Um, yeah, convert, converting CO2 into starch more efficiently than plants. I wonder if they're coming back. Oh, well, then that means you're not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't read a lot. Well, I read a lot this week. <laughs> and yeah. A lot and not a lot. <laughs> um, but I did really like um, this thread that I put in the themes channel. And I've also, I think I put a, a link up here already. Did I? <sighs> yes. So this... Twitter thread that I put on under topics of study and I'll put it down here under the notes as well is about NFTs um, NFT avatar projects I'll just put the first bit and it's really cool whoops me and Notion don't get on very well when we're pasting. <laughs> yes, no, I totally agree with you on the Notion thing. You yeah. got to be really careful to co- copy or cut just the text in the field and not the field. Uh, anyway, this is I, think... I deleted a, a whole section of the analytic field. <laughs> Um, so here's the, here's the detail in the notes, but so the first, the first tweet, and it's about 16 different tweets. So obviously I won't read them all. Um, but it says, what's the end game for NFT avatar projects? Are we just buying silly animal JPEGs or is the most crucial parts of the metaverse identity, culture, and social being onboarded right before our eyes? Um, And then it goes on to um, talk about various projects with, you know, 3D avatars and being able to rent an avatar to attend a virtual concert and, um, like, obviously taking them into the gaming realm, um, having physical merchandise associated with NFTs, which apparently the Meta Factory do um obviously income generation and um having your 10 avatars play a soccer match together so there's some really cool ideas just like things that oh having using your avatar in zoom meetings (laughs) yeah Um, yeah so just it's a really nice thread of different kind of things that are happening um and i think again like like your article it, it's actually a, a really nice introduction to the idea that they're not just a bunch of jpegs and that this this work that's going on is actually leading to something way bigger than possibly a lot of people can imagine right now um so i think we both found things this week that are really good introductory texts for people <laughs> uh, to read for sure yeah, no, I think this article is interesting. I like, you know, one of the things from creating NFTs that I've 
found interesting is that you can store your attributes on IPFS. And so it's just like a further way to decentralize, you know, your asset, your digital asset or whatever you're trying to do. Yeah. And that wasn't, that was something that, that changes your JPEG into, instead of just a JPEG, it changes it into an IPFS panel. Something that's stored and accessible, and that you can, you know, have more control over your rights through. Yeah. Um, the last tweet, number 17, is um, I believe we're all going to end up in a Ready Player One reality, each with our community <laughs> stories. Um, LFG. <laughs> Yeah, I need to I need to DM this person and let them know <laughs> that I'm already living in a van. <laughs> they can, you are player one. <laughs> they can, you are ready. <laughs> yeah, I call this the the ready player zero X van. <laughs> yep. Well, you have a community and you have your stories. So, um, yeah. No, it's, it's, um, I really liked it. I, I think you'll like the thread if you have a look at it. Um, and yep. this person that, this person that tweeted this was actually part of the, um, NFT Australia Fest that was on the other day, uh, which was a full day of people talking about NFTs. Nice. Uh, and this person, yeah, actually demonstrated Decentraland to the group. Um, as part of the presentation and I pretty much immediately went and followed them on Twitter because of how interesting they were and then now I found this thread so a good follow yeah I'm gonna tag crypto booty what I brought to book club this week well, thank you I think the reason I, I mean, I totally understand that and it makes perfect sense. I think the reason that I then sort of have to adjust my thinking around it is that the whole thing about NFTs that took off and, and made it into people's consciousness was that they're, you know, worth a lot of money or, or they can be. And so I think I mm -hmm. keep judging NFTs in terms of, well, why would that be worth something? But it doesn't have to be worth a million dollars to be, to have value to somebody. Um, but I keep kind yeah, of going, no. well, well, what would, you know, why, well, that would never sell for a million dollars. So, you know, so I keep, I need to kind of adjust. And that's why I liked that thread because it made me think, okay, this is, this is not just about, yeah, trading images that, that people kind of have FOMO for. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's the technology behind it that's actually really interesting. 